So uh, I have a confession to make, which is that this talk title is not accurate. Uh, it seemed accurate three or four months ago when I submitted the talk, but then as I was seeing the conference program coming together, as I was seeing the other talks, I realized I probably shouldn't have called it designing in complexity so much as designing in spite of complexity. Uh, I think a lot of the talks that we've seen the last day and a half, two days, um, have talked about how you transform systems, how you design in complex spaces. And this talk is specifically going to be about how you avoid doing that. And you might be thinking, but Julie, that's the best part of the job, right? And as designers and service designers, we love complexity. This is just one of the many models out there. This is from Humantific of sort of the different scopes of design. Um, and we definitely love sort of tackling the big hairy things in the 3.0 and 4.0 space. And I thought that too until a few years ago when I moved from working in consumer products to working in an innovation lab inside a health system. And right away, I noticed a fairly alarming pattern in all of my projects. Namely, a client would come to the team, and they'd have a request that seemed pretty reasonable. You know, maybe they're looking for a new opportunity, uh, they have an idea they want to get some feedback on, they have an existing product or service that they know they have some problems with, they want to improve all good, solid, reasonable requests of a design group. So I'd meet with them, you know, chat with them about the problem, and they'd sort of describe their current state. And again, you know, all seemingly reasonable. They'd have a few people, a few steps, seem great. But like any good designer, I want to go out there, see for myself, build that empathy. And so time and time again, I would go out into the field armed with their clean little model that they gave me. And time and time again, I would find a mess, like a big mess. Like in the far picture, that sort of pink stripe is one drop down menu in a website that they were like, oh, it's a, just a simple website. <laughs> So then there I'd be, two and a half, three and a half weeks into maybe like a six or eight week project, and I'm in the unenviable position, having to go back to the client, you know, the director, or the VP, whoever it was, and be like, so <laughs> there were a few things you didn't know. And that's when I realized that we, as service designers, love tackling big, hairy, problems, and our clients sometimes not so much. Because what I didn't realize was when I moved from consumer products into healthcare, I was also moving from the world of kind of simpler systems into what's known as complex adaptive systems. Um, and what makes these so hard to design is, is the challenge in them isn't so much finding a 3.0 or 4.0 problem to work on, because those are everywhere. The problem, the challenge of working in these systems is actually just keeping your sort of day-to-day -day bread and butter 1.0 and 2.0 projects from blowing up <laughs> and becoming these huge messes. So, um, what do we do about it? The first thing, before we go any further, I just wanted to define a few words about systems. If I asked anyone in the room, you'd probably come up with something like, oh, it's a bunch of stuff that works together to do something. And you'd be really pretty close to sort of the canonical definition. Interconnected set of elements, coherently organized, does something. And there's just a few 
sort of embedded concepts there. A system that's made up of elements, that's the stuff, doesn't have to be concrete, it can be sort of concepts. The stuff is connected in some way, um, could be the flows of information, of value. And then, and this is important, it has a purpose. And a system, in a system sense, a purpose, it's not what's written on the org chart or on the website. The purpose comes from the actual behavior of the system itself. So a system sort of is what a system does. And then there's one more idea that's kind of hinted at in the definition, which is boundary. So when you're working in systems, it is really easy to get overwhelmed because, like, everything is connected, right? The whole universe is connected. And so there's a tendency to pull a thread and then sort of just start unraveling the whole sweater. Um, and so boundaries, you have to be intentional about where you put them. You kind of have to decide. They're a little artificial. And there's always some tension between the boundary and the purpose, you know. Uh, where you draw the boundary kind of defines how you'll talk about the purpose of the system. So four parts, pretty straightforward. I don't think that's new to anyone. And complex adaptive systems, same four parts, right? Except just like more, like so many elements and people and technology. Sometimes you'll hear the word socio-technical system. Um, and then the connections, all the pieces aren't just connected, they're interconnected. So every piece sort of has some kind of relationship with every other one. And as you're getting all these connections, you're also starting to get this nesting effect where you get systems inside of systems. And those subsystems might not all have purposes that go together. I mean, in healthcare, when you think about sort of the care aspect versus the billing or business aspect, you start to see how some of these purposes can actually be uh, less than compatible. And then finally, the boundaries, as I mentioned, you know, you tend to see a lot of deeply nested things. They're fuzzy, they're permeable. You could draw a boundary here, there. One person might actually live in more than one space. Basically, these are like systems plus, plus, plus. But also, when systems get big, they don't just get plus, plus, plus. They also get a little weird. And so they start having these properties. And these properties are sort of a subject for a whole nother talk. But these systems, they exhibit emergence, they're nonlinear, they adapt, they're regulated by these feedback loops. And the main takeaway of all these properties is exactly what we've learned over the last day and a half, which is when you're trying to influence a system, design a system, uh, it has to be really holistic, inclusive. You're trying to bring everyone to the table. You want to take a really facilitative approach. Kind of the solution has to come from the system itself. Um, and you need to be really observant and responsive. You know, it takes a long time. You need to make an intervention, see what happens, make some tweaks. And I think that theme has come across pretty clearly from all the talks, that these are really, really challenging spaces to work in. But there's one property in particular that's especially important if you're trying to keep your 1 and 2.0 projects from getting too big and the property of these systems that makes that so hard. And that's self-organization. Now, if anyone here works in software on an agile team, you probably are sick of this word. Everybody wants to have a self-organizing team. And what does that really mean? It's really just a, a bottom-up theory of um, order management. Um, as opposed to a top-down one. So global order arises from the local interaction, the lower-level parts rather than being imposed. And self-organization kind of has two sort of sub-characteristics that really impact our work. And that's in these self-organized systems, the knowledge of the system is distributed and also the control of the system is distributed. So what does this mean for us? With distributed knowledge, it means that no single actor has the uh, view or understanding of the entire system at once, right? Because 
uh, the sort of functioning, the order of the whole system is coming up from the bottom. So each actor, each element really only knows their little part, which leads to a condition known as systems blindness, which then you can kind of understand the situations I was getting into. Because uh, the people I was were dealing with, you know, these were people with good intentions, intelligent, successful people, but they only knew their little area. They didn't see kind of the wider ecosystem, the layers. So that's one problem with working in these systems, that it leads to your clients often coming to you um, with sort of naive briefs, briefs that seem reasonable but are actually like way too broad. They kind of cross these boundaries between subsystems that have cross purposes that maybe impact an area that your client doesn't really have any control over. So you see these sort of naive briefs from systems blindness. And now distributed control, this is an interesting one, because when I was researching this talk, I came across an article in none other than the Touch Points journal from the Service Design Network. Um, and this was from a year or two ago. And basically, the authors sort of did a survey of a lot of recent service design work and found at the point of implementation, the number one risk, like by far, like 68%, the number one risk is what they characterized as organizational challenges. And the way that they described it were some sort of quotes like this, it's good enough, do we even need to change it, is there even a problem here? Uh, why weren't we informed of this? I think that's probably something a lot of us <laughs> have bumped into, the late in the game stakeholder popping up. Um, when I read this list of symptoms, this is exactly the symptoms you would expect to see in a condition known as systems immune response. And this comes from the fact, so in these systems, because control is distributed, right? That's a bottom-up theory. No single actor has the authority or the power to impose a change on the system. Um, and so if they try, if you come in as a designer and you try to release some new thing, all that happens is those little lower level parts, right? And they have their own patterns of how they work. Uh, they have their own purpose, maybe. And basically, they'll just find a way to work around whatever it is you're trying to impose. They are going to fight to sort of maintain their purpose and self-perpetuate. And sometimes this is called like policy resistance or organ rejection. From a positive point of view, it's resilience, you know, which is wonderful in nature, but will drive you bonkers on a design project because you'll have this wonderful idea and then you'll release it and, you know, you'll have stakeholders saying things like, that's nice, but we're not going to do that. All right, so these things are complicated. They're hard to work in. The very properties of the system are going to sometimes fight against us. What can we do? Um, obviously, you know, one option is to go back to the client and be like, there's some things you didn't know, and make the case for more resources, more time, really taking a systemic design approach. And sometimes you might have a client who's down with that, but another thing I think we heard from the other talks is a lot of those projects, it's not just the appetite of your client, there's also a timing element. It might just not be the right time for them to be undertaking some you know, major system culture change project. So you can advocate for a systemic design process and do it the way that many of the case studies here approached it. But there is another way, um, which is basically to go back to your client, try to address that system's blindness. So you're trying to reveal to them the system that they didn't know was there. And then try to find a safe space for them to design, an area that actually they do have power or authority over or you know, at least they have some influence over a space that doesn't uh, cross boundaries. So essentially try to carve a safe 
2.0 project out of that 3.0 mess. So you're addressing the system's blindness, and then you're avoiding the system's immune response. And I don't really have a name for this. You could call it like systems-aware design or systems-sensitive design. And you can think of it as, you know, a third diamond. I know here we've been like the double diamond. Is it over? Did it change? Does it need to change? What's the new diamond? But you know, if we just take the old version of it as as a starting point, you can think of this as either another diamond up front. It really follows the divergent convergent process. So you can also just think of it as putting a wider lens on that problem space research. So. Uh, if you work in one of these industries, healthcare, government, education, uh, a lot of B2B products where the person buying the product isn't the person using it, these are all kind of red flags that you're probably going to, you're at high risk of running into a mess. Um, and so anticipating that you might, you know, rather than planning to do just the traditional user research, problem research, go in with a little bit wider lens so that you're starting to see, if it's there, what that system looks like so you can then bring it back to the client. And there's kind of two phases of this. So again, follows that divergent convergence. So not really necessarily even any need to tell your client you're doing it. You don't have to be like, I think you don't know what you're talking about, so we're going to need an extra six weeks. Um, you can just work as you usually do. And the first is to kind of survey the system, get the lay of the land. In systems thinking speak, it's getting up on the balcony so you can see everything. Um, and then going back and scoping it with your client to find that safe space. And it's really they who need to define it. It would be very hard for you to really guess. So that's sort of more of a collaborative process. If anyone has ever tried to get into systems thinking and has gotten bogged down in uh, stock and flow diagrams or causal loop diagrams, fear not. <laughs> because doing this, since we're not really working in the systems change space so much as just the systems aware space, um, all of the methods to do this are completely accessible and actually are going to be pretty familiar to us. You know, so already some of these are probably things you're like, oh, I do that already. And so it's really just sort of changing the framing of what you do. So in the surveying part, it's all about methods that help you pull in as many perspectives as possible. You want to be looking at sort of all the adjacent areas. You're trying to identify all those elements, all the people, all the tools, all the environments, so that you'll be able to go back to the client and have them be like, oh, yeah, no, that team, yeah, we don't have a good relationship with them. Or this team, yeah, you know what, they're like already on a limited budget. We're not even going to ask them. So um, two that I really like to use that were new, like a lot of these, you know, you probably know, um, are a method called the, the rich picture method. This actually comes out of soft systems methodology, Peter Chuckland. Um, but it's basically this idea that you kind of want to have people doing a brain dump, getting everything out of their head. So it's like a, a, a mind map or a concept map. But you want to introduce some sketching. And so you can do it different ways. You can start people with post-it notes and have them lay out everything and then maybe have them draw on top of it if you've got an audience that's like very uncomfortable drawing. You can start them right with drawing. Another thing I found in the Touchpoints Journal, the Touchpoints Journal is great, uh, <laughs> is uh, the Hitachi Design Lab invented business origami, which is basically rich picture method, but with some uh, kind of 3D things that you lay out. Anyway, the point is, you're just trying to get everything onto the table, everything that could be part of this system. And then you need to go and do a layer of, OK, what are the relationships? And that's where the iceberg model comes in which came up in one or two other talks, but this one is a little bit different. It's a lot of icebergs. Um, <laughs> which is pulling one or two of the elements out and walking through, you know, what is it? What happened? What is this thing? And then trying to get down into what are patterns? You know, what's happening over time? 
What about this system is causing that to happen, supporting it? Um, and then what are the mental models? So you go from the stuff you can see, concrete stuff, down to um, kind of the more values driven. And that's going to help you under start to get a sense of where a safe space might be, because you start seeing those relationships, those conflicts. Um, and then the second phase is the scoping phase, which again, a lot of methods that you might know. Obviously, you do want to create a system map. We'll come back to that. Um, but an interesting one that I've found that really helps is uh, it's not a stakeholder map. It's a circles of influence map, which is a little bit different. And this is for facilitating the discussion of, OK, you're the VP, you're the director, you're important. This is a space where you're feeling a lot of pain. You came to me. You want to work on this. Where do you feel comfortable truly working? Who or what space, what people, what elements of the system do you feel you really have control over? You can go in, you can take action. You can say, we're going to work a different way, and people will work a different way. What areas, you know, you have some influence on. We could bring those stakeholders to the table, see where they're at, negotiate with them. And then what's the area, realistically, where we will probably start bumping into that system immune response. Let's try to stay out of that area. Um, and so this is just another kind of thing that goes along with regular stakeholder mapping that allows you to have that discussion of where's a safe place to play. Um, two tips if you're going to try to uh, corral your 1.0 and 2.0 projects and have them not, even though we love them, have them not expand out into the 3 and 4.0 space. Two tips is one, make a lot of maps. So we love our super complex. It's a service blueprint and a journey map, and it's got emotion and front stage and backstage, and it looks awesome. But for these discussions, make a lot of maps. If you have a point you want to make, make a map just for that. Don't try to cram it all in with these like shock and awe maps. So this is sort of a more practical method. It's not about the, um, you know, making something amazing that will go on their wall so much as getting them to be like, oh yeah, that workflow is a lot bigger than we thought. Um, and then the other tip is be ready for anything. It's actually surprising. Um, you know, of the projects I worked on, two of them were like, oh, OK. One was a website. They wanted to rebuild the whole database. They were like, oh, OK. Well, let's at least just improve like the layout of the website. We can, you know, we can address the back end architecture that a lot of other stakeholders we're going to have opinions on. We can address that later. Um, one of them in the process actually kind of discovered self made a, a new idea. So they essentially just pivoted and were like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a mess. Um, but we're, we've thought of something else we can do, so thank you. And then one of them was like, oh, mm, and put the idea in the backlog, where it probably lives to this day. Um, so they weren't quite ready to give up on it, but acknowledged that they couldn't work on it. And you might occasionally have a stakeholder who's like, let's take on the world. And then you get into your real systems design methods. And that is it. So hopefully that gave people, sometimes I feel like it's almost like permission to not design the whole thing, uh, but just try to keep that project small, get something done, and design in spite of the complexity that you're facing. So thank you.